Today we find ourselves in the second Sunday of Advent. As we progress through the Sundays of Advent, we progress through three separate themes. The first being the four last things, death, judgment, hell, and heaven. Today being the Sunday of judgment. The second theme we progress through is that of the four powers of the magician. To know, to will, to dare, to keep silent. Shire, vele, audere, tacere. Today is the Sunday of will. And of course the four elements in their progression from plasma to solid, fire or plasma, air or gas, liquid or water, and solid or earth. Today is the Sunday of air. How do these themes play together? How do they intertwine as a three-stranded garland of sorts? Well, that's the trick of it, you see. I've spent this week thinking of a lot of material, thinking of a lot of connections, but I was not able to figure out a concrete way to present it. So this is going to be probably an unusual, maybe even a usual week where I throw a lot at the wall and some of it's going to stick and some of it won't. Let's start with judgment. What is the judgment? Judgment, in its simplest sense, is the application of your will in making a decision. Now, of course, we hear it say, judge not, lest you be judged. The Bible says you're not supposed to judge. You hear that a lot. But you see, that's also taken from the Gospel of Matthew, but they don't read the next verse. How you judge is how you will be judged. How you measure is how you will be measured. So, that's not saying don't judge at all. It's a warning against judging others too harshly, which is an all-too-human concern. How many times, like for example, when we were in school, in fact, high school is probably the best example of this. How many times have we heard people talk about that weird kid that's walking down the hall? Or how many times do we hear about the gossips? How many times do we talk, hear about what some guy is doing or what some girl is doing behind closed doors? It was really common to hear this kind of talk in high school. And there are people out there who still are judgmental, who still make harsh judgments on people whether they are deserved or not. That's only one aspect of judgment. Judgment is used any time you make a decision. For example, I know, I know a person, hypothetically speaking, let's say this person has a track record of... This person has a track record of running their mouth in front of the wrong people and then leaving their, leaving their friends to handle the mess. Let's say that. Now, to judge the person is to say, this is a bad person. But, to, ju to judge the action, to make a judgment of, do I want to associate with a person who acts this way? That's, that's more than acceptable because this is a survival skill. It's also called the behavioral immune system. You choose certain behaviors to keep yourself out of trouble. You choose certain behaviors to keep yourself healthy. And so in that case, I'm exercising my judgment not to associate with somebody who's, whose actions are going to get me in trouble. That's an acceptable judgment. That's a judgment you should be making. It's sound judgment. Unsound judgment is that person is bad, that person is evil, that person is going to hell. Because the minute you judge somebody as going to hell, remember, the standard by which you judge is the standard by which you will be judged. But where does the will come into this? To know, to will, to dare, to keep silent. The will comes into this in that once you make a judgment call, in fact, I think that's a really, a really, good, um, a really good phrase here, judgment call. Once you make a judgment call whether to pursue a course of action or not, the will is what keeps you fixed on that course of action. The will is what keeps you fixed on the path you're traveling. It's what keeps you, keeps you fixed on the goals that you set for yourself and on attaining that goal. Now, this is also what we see in the Gospel. John's disciples went to Jesus and asked him, Are you the Christ or are we waiting for somebody else? Jesus said, Look at what's happening 
come to your own decisions, i.e. come to your own judgment. So Jesus is saying, judge me based on my works. Judge whether or not I am who you think I am based on my works. And that's how we should be with anybody. Look at the evidence and come to a conclusion on the evidence. Not our preconceptions, not our biases, not our prejudices, not our hang-ups, and certainly not something called transference. Transference is, suppose when you were a kid, you meet somebody who was, who you either really liked a lot or who you just couldn't stand. Then later on, you meet somebody, like say you're an adult, you meet somebody who reminds you of that person. And all of a sudden, your feelings about that person are exactly the feelings of the person they remind you of. Not cool. Because what you're doing there is, you're precluding that person from being their own authentic self. You're precluding that person from your mind and simply judging them in terms of somebody else. Not cool. But, again, if you're judging a course of action, like say, say I want, I want to lose like 20 or 30 pounds, which actually I do need to do. So I'm going to use this because it works. I'm, I don't want to eat a whole lot of sugar. I don't want to eat a whole lot of things that, well, I actually happen to like eating. I like meat. I like things that have saturated fats. I, I like grains. Right, I'm Italian. I eat pasta. Come on. Actually, it's called macaron, but, you know, same difference. So, you know, all that stuff. So, my judgment is to make that decision. And my will is what fixes me and confirms me in this decision. Because without that will, there is no perseverance in judgment. Without that will, there is no progression along the path. Without that will, there is only falling right back to where you started and not progressing further. So the will is what keeps you in your spiritual practice. The will is what keeps you on your quest for getting results. The will is what keeps you making things happen. But it is possible for us to act in judgment and in will with, it, with bad information. For example, when I first encountered neo-pagans, I very quickly noticed a difference between those who were originally raised Catholic and those who were originally raised Protestant. Whereas those raised Novus Ordo or Magisterial Protestant, they seemed to fit somewhere in between. That was actually pretty interesting. It can't, what occurred to me was, those who were raised Catholic, they were interested in the spirituality. In fact, the most culturally Catholic person I know is an Orthodox Gardnerian, third degree. Just let that rumble around in your head for a minute. Okay. Now, so those who are raised Catholic seem to be in it for the spirituality. Those who are raised Protestant, they seem to be in it to rebel against their parents. I mean, that's the impression I got. However, I didn't... However, and some probably... I think there are some in, from all stripes that are rebelling against their parents. But here's the thing. It was very easy for me to judge because I found the latter group very annoying. I, 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 really, I really did. I found them very difficult to talk to because their priorities were different. But then I was recently reading a book, and it's kind of interesting because it's very close to something I'd already surmised, but it brings in the details. Spiritual Traditions for the Contemporary Church. I, it's been on my, my bookshelf for five years, and I only just now started reading it. Well, one of the chapters, the contributor is a Reformed pastor, and he's talking about Reformed spirituality, the traditional word being piety. And one thing he says is that spirituality as an inward quest is very foreign to the Reformed tradition. Now understand, mo most Protestants fit in, a, in an umbrella group called the Reformed. That's the vast majority. Reformed, Anabaptist, and, and usually some hybrid. Okay, so with that, then he's describing that Reformed piety, because that's the traditional word, it's very outward focused. It's not an inward quest, it's outward focused. And what there is of self-reflection, it's, it's de-emphasized, but what there is of self-reflection, like the Puritan tradition of keeping diaries, was simply, how may I react better to my neighbor? How may I be more faithful in my calling? It's not having faith, i.e. an interior thing, but being faithful, an exterior thing. It's very hands and feet oriented. How do I act based on my callings? How do I act in terms of my responsibilities? How do I act towards my neighbor? How do I act towards society? It's very external. And so, 
what what I found what I found there is like as to quote a conversation I had recently, the scales fell off my eyes because that explained where these Protestant born were coming from. Yes, in a way they were bound against their their parents. They were bound against their churches, as Kathy says. Most of us are looking for more than hellfire and brimstone, salvation and damnation that the prop churches teach. Now, for, for those of you who know, she said this publicly, she was raised Baptist. So, I'm putting that out there so you have context of who's making this comment. But you see, here's the thing. Even if this is a tradition where the people leaving it, they want to get out of hellfire, damnation, and brimstone, and all that, they're still raised on this very social-oriented, exterior-oriented type of piety. And now, while Catholic spirituality tends to be inward, it tends to be inward, tends to focus on progression through the purgative, the illuminative, and the unitive life, and tends on working towards union with God, and that's what Catholic spirituality re really focuses on, Protestant piety tends to focus on the outward, and I really do think bo both are necessary. One is the contemplative life, the other is the act of life. I think that both are necessary. But both, taken by themselves without the other, they fall, they have pitfalls. When you're focusing exclusively on the inner, for example, what happens is you can become delusional. Unless you have some type of network of friends, some network of, some network of spiritual direction, somebody to keep you in touch with reality, you can become delusional, you can become victim to flights of fancy in your inner worlds. But you even see this in New Age authors. Ted Andrews talks about this in his Imagic. Funny story about him is he started out a mountaintop at the same time my father was there, but I don't remember meeting him. But he does talk, he does talk about it. In fact, a lot, there are a number of New Age authors who do talk about it, but nobody in the New Age movement seems to listen. So that is there. But now you take the Protestant perspective, where it's totally outward focused. The pitfall of that is you become neighbor conscious. You become obsessed with what the neighbors think. Think of, how, think of how many times we hear about the hypocrite preacher or the hypocrites that go to church. And a lot of the pagans I met that came from Protestant households, one thing they would complain about is how their parents would be so religious in church, but they were such hypocrites in private. How they'd be such good, wonderful people in public, but in private, they were total bastards. And that's the problem of an outward-focused piety with no inner dimension, or with very little inner dimension. And so, judgment in this case tells us, how do we take the best of both worlds and put it into a synthesis? Mystical theology tells us that the act of life, which is exterior-focused, and the contemplative life can be combined with what's called the mixed life where you are involved in the corporal works of mercy, feeding the sick, clothing the poor, and all that. And you're also involved in the spiritual works of mercy, which is praying for others, and also your own spiritual development. You can be involved in both. You can be involved in both. Now Todd says, I like some brimstone from time to time. Brimstone spelled with the Y. Love you too, dude. Hey, I'm glad you can make it today. I know, I know it's, we've been um, hitting and missing each other every, every now and then. But you see, where we are on this, it's not just judging everybody outside of your in-group and everything outside your in-group as bad just because it's outside your in-group. It is about... It is about discerning, about knowing. We talked about knowledge last week and about making an informed conclusion, which is your judgment, that proceeding further in light of that conclusion, which is your will. Now, some, something that I forgot to mention last week that I'd like to talk about this week, is when we look at these Sundays, when we look at any Sunday of the church year, we can actually get some idea of what is intended on the interpretation of these Sundays by looking at the propers. Okay, if you turn, let's see, today's propers are on page 255 in my New Everyday Prayer book. If you have a copy in front of you, turn to page 255. You'll see the first of the propers is the introit. The part that I sang earlier, People of Zion, behold, the Lord shall come to save the nations. Now, for each of, now for each of these, this is a small T tradition, so there's nothing binding here, 
but it gives you an idea of what the church was thinking when they accepted these particular melodies. Because there are eight melodies that can be used with, with these texts. Each of the melodies is associated with a given planet. They're mode 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. And they match the planets of the days of the week. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 is Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. 8 is the sphere of fixed stars. The 8th sphere of Dante's Paradisum. Okay. Now, last Sunday's intro was to, mo was to tone 8. Tone 8 or mode 8. The hypomixolydian which is associated with the sphere of fixed stars, is the breaking of boundaries. And we're talking about knowing, we're talking about fire, we were talking about death, which effectively is transition and going from cycle to cycle. So, the actual mode, the actual musical mode, it gave us a hint to what was being talked about. Now, on, on another tip, the hypomixolydian mode is also associated with the element of earth and the melancholic temperament. It's, it's used, that particular musical mode, it's used to decrease the melancholic temperament in order to help balance somebody who's overly melancholy. So there's a little hint about medieval Western medicine for you, too. Now, today's introit is to mode 7. Also the element of earth and the humor melancholy is the Mixolydian mode, and it's associated with the planet Saturn. Now, what this talks about is boundaries, and judgment is a setting of boundaries. A setting of boundaries in terms of how you wish to act, how you wish others to act towards you, what your goals are, and how you wish to get there. Because there is no progress without some limitation, delimiting what it is you want and how you want to get it, and putting as fine a point on it as possible. So what we have here in the, in the melodies, we already have some hint of how these Sundays are intended to be interpreted how these readings are intended to be preached and what can be drawn from the readings in the context of the Sunday. See, this is why when preachers, ha when preachers go, go, go off on a given Sunday and they act like they don't know the text they're preaching, they don't know what they're talking about, I want to have sympathy with them, but I really can't because there are so many resources out there, it's really hard to get it wrong. If you're halfway confident... If you spend at least 30 minutes a week doing some prep work, you can shoot from the hip and get something and get something at least passably decent out there. And what I'm sharing with you are some of the resources. The musical melodies are part are part of the resources even. It it works out so well. Such a beautiful seamless garment there. So this brings us to the element of air. Air in this case is the wind that blows away the impurities. And as Captain Picard once said, leaves us with a pure product, the truth. In fact, if you've, if you've seen the episode that where he says that, it's actually rather prescient because we now have a, um, we now live in a world where a robot was given citizenship in Saudi Arabia, it was a year or two ago. So it was, pretty pre it was a pretty prescient episode because that question is going to come up. But yes, Bur burning away or blowing away impurities to where we're left with that pure product, the truth. And that truth is what we must go do, act on, in order to find our judgment and our will to carry us. A judgment based on a partial truth or an untruth or an incomplete truth is going to be an incomplete judgment and bring incomplete results. You... As a magician or a spiritual worker, and there are some, there are some quote, quote, regular churches where they talked about magic, and, but they used the word spiritual work. That's where I got this word from. So, for spiritual workers, you have to get that truth first. You have to make your judgments. You have to have the will to stick by the judgment and the will to persevere in doing the right thing that will get you to your goal. Whether we're talking about a deontological piety, which is duty-oriented. Well, I described a Protestant piety earlier. It's duty-oriented. It's not, I'm um, negotiating my calling with my neighbor because it will get me in good standing with my neighbor. It is, I am doing this out of duty to God because God commands it, and I must obey God. That's the important thing to keep in mind here. It's a deontological piety. Now, me, I'm not very deontological. I'm very teleological. I think I talked about this last week. I've talked about it on the blog, too. 
Really, I care about the goal. I care about the means to the end. And both methods work as long as they're kept in a valid context. And so with that, what do we do? I think this Advent, we should keep in our personal reflections, whether reflections that help us to react better to our neighbor or reflections that help us better to react within ourselves, within our own spiritual quest. Are the results we are working for manifesting? Are they the best results for ourselves? If so, then we should impose our will to manifest those results to the absolute best of our ability and impose our will to increase our ability when we find ourselves lacking. Should we, should we do anything else? Of course we should. This is a, this is a, constant, a, this is a constant walk of prayer, of vigilance, of conversation, and of growth, with growth being the goal. And as we progress through Advent, I would like to think and hope that the wind of the Spirit will wash over us, that the wind of the Spirit will help cleanse us of our impurities, and that the wind of the Spirit will bring us to that hope that joy, that peace, that love. See how I fit the new school attributions in there? That will come when we celebrate the birthday of Christ on Christmas Day.